Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, and welcome to the uh, February edition of ARC Talks. Um, it's a real privilege to have the opportunity to chair the debate this afternoon. Uh, the debate is on, as I'm sure you're aware, on the future of technical and vocational education. My name is Nick Linford. I'm the former editor of FE Week. I also have the dubious honour of founding the newspaper FE Week alongside the uh, newspaper you may be more familiar with, Schools Week. So they're both my newspapers, although not as involved as I used to be. Uh, and prior to that, I worked for about 15 years. I know I look very young, uh, about 15 years within the further education sector, um, working for primarily a, a large uh, uh, further education college, Lewisham College in South East London. But in my time, I have worked a bit for private training providers um, and for a charity, education charity as well. So a bit of, bit of experience on my part in both the kind of education uh, delivery space and the, the policy side, and particularly around the further education, or as we're going to call it, the technical and vocational education uh, arena. Uh, it's great to have everyone uh, joining us for February ARC Talks. Thank you everyone for tuning in. We've got a great set of panellists that I'll be introducing very shortly. Just a few housekeeping points to start with. Um, this event is being recorded and uh, it will be made available shortly after the, uh, the session on the ARC website. Um, the audience, you out there, uh, we can't see you um, uh, and we can't hear you, uh, but of course we are using Zoom and uh, Zoom has a very good chat function. We're just going to use the chat function if that's okay, rather than the question and answer function. So please do chat to each other, but, but I will be looking out for the questions, those ones with the question marks at the end, um, uh, all comments. I'll be looking for both. Um, whilst the panellists are speaking, I'll be checking that frequently. And we're really keen to, uh, in the short time we have together, to generate some uh, engagement from you. So please think carefully. I've got a couple sent to me already just to uh, make sure we fill the time if you're feeling a bit shy. But we're hope hoping that you will be looking forward to uh, having some contributions to this particular uh, ARC talk. So we will be finishing by six o'clock. That gives us about 55 minutes of valuable time. So we don't want to waste any of it. So I do uh, now very much look forward to hearing from our panelists. We're first gonna hear from uh, Lord Kenneth Baker. Really, really grateful to him as our ARC to join us this afternoon. Very influential figure, former Secretary of State for Education, particularly influential then and now in the vocational and technical education space. Very familiar to many of you, particularly around university technical colleges and so forth. And, and he'll be uh, talking uh, first. We'll then hear from Matt Jones, who is the principal at the ARC Globe Academy. And then uh, finally, and certainly not last, uh, uh, Ruth Coyle, uh, director of sixth form at Le Retreat, um, which is an early adopter of T-levels, uh, which is, I think if I, my homework has served me correctly as a Roman Catholic uh, girls' school. Uh, so very much looking forward to hearing from uh, Ruth's perspective as well. So without further ado, in the short time we have, uh, opening remarks. So if I can now uh, hand over to Lord uh, Kenneth Baker uh, in the context of the future of technical and vocational education, uh, over to you. Well, well, thank you very much for inviting me to um, participate and initiate this debate for your situation. Before we get on to pre and post 16, just a little history. Aristotle divided education into two elements. One was liberal and one was mechanical. The liberal were for young men who could read and write, who met each other, who were the, really the ruling class of uh, Athens. The mechanical were just in those, slave, those days the slaves, but they were just the people who sort of did the trades and kept society going. And this big division has really dominated British education throughout its history. The first great example of it was the foundation of the grammar schools. The grammar schools were si simply the Aristotelian liberal people. And they, had, uh, they were selected and they went through and they contributed a huge amount to the country and a huge amount to the government of the country over the centuries. When it came to the 19th century, the public schools were invented but one forgets entirely what happened in the other schools. A lot of children in the inner cities went to what were called ragged schools and Dickens wrote about them in the 1950s, in the 1850s. And um, uh, they were often kept going by charity. They were lucky if they had two classrooms, there's usually one classroom with a large number of different ages in it. And it was basically reading, writing, arithmetic, and that was it. And in the 1870 act, that distinction was continued. 
because the introduction of the elementary schools in 1870 and the, the increasing power of the Department of Education and the Department of Education has focused in its entire history upon um, academic subjects. It has never prepared a technical curriculum. It has never actually agreed a technical qualification that is created. And this division still persists. And the skills bill, in my view, is going to make it even greater. But we'll come on to that later. Now, the big re the reason why we have not been good at vocational education is that schools have never taken it seriously. Um, when I uh, passed the A-level in Southport in 1945, we were evacuated there. I went to the King George V Grammar School. And the only lesson I can remember of that grammar school was the two hours of carpentry every week where I learned to do tenon and uh, dovetail joints, which if pushed, I can still do. All that has long disappeared and so has most vocational education. And what Gove did in 2012 was to appoint Lady Wolf to um, examine the number of qualifications. And she came up with a proposal that abolished a huge number of GCSE, some of which needed abolishing. And that allowed uh, Gove to introduce the uh, Progress 8 and EBAC curriculum, which is totally Aristotelian. It is eight academic subjects. And technical subjects have been totally squeezed out of that. And what has happened since then is that design technology has dropped by 80% in schools. And if it goes on for the like this in the next election, it'll virtually disappear altogether. But not only that, the cultural creative subjects have also, like dance, drama, performing arts, a media, have dropped by between 40 and 50%, just at a time when the demand for them is burgeoning with, with, with streaming, with Netflix, with new film studios and all of that, um, the, the virtually they're dropping out of, of secondary schools as well. And I think this is a major disaster and it's been a, a, a disastrous experiment because the number, the whole theory that uh, Go was working to was run by Hirsch in America, which says that if you give them as disadvantaged children, a course in academic education, they will bubble up to the top. Well, this is absolute rubbish. The number of disadvantaged children today in 2022 is about the same as the number of disadvantaged children in 2012, roughly about 30% of the school population. They have not really uh, made any significant improvement in that. And so I think that when you start to talk about vocational education, you've got to reintroduce it in 11 to 16 year old schools. We are the only country in Europe that does not have technical courses at 11 to 16. It's one of the reasons why Germany's youth unemployment is half ours and that we have a higher level of youth unemployment um, in most European countries. And indeed, um, while it's an average of 9%, in the disadvantaged areas like Sandwell, like Northumbria in the Northeast, like the East Coast of the East, Eastern boroughs of London, you get uh, pockets where youth unemployment is 20%. Um, and the government really doesn't talk about this at all. It insists upon progress aid and EBAC. And I'm glad to say that there have been now three major reports um, demanding reform. The first was the uh, report from the HNC before Christmas by the High Minister of St. Paul's School. She had 750 responses, half of them from the state sector. And her conclusion was that the present curriculum and assessment method is not fit for purpose. Then there was a report of the House of Lords Select Committee on Employment, which I served on, a very, very radical report, which, which identified a complete mismatch between what schools were producing and what industry and commerce wanted actually from the schooling system. And um, we had very radical proposals about reforming um, the curriculum, but also reforming the apprenticeship levy. The third report is going to be the report from the Times Commission, which will publish in June. They published their preliminary uh, paper now. So you've got three major reports of, of, of considerable experience in education. This these aren't these aren't fly by just academic studies. They are practical people on it. People outside the world of education as well employers um, and uh, senior journalists. 
uh, financial journalists like Luke jo like Johnson. Um, and they're all saying the same thing. And I think any discussion on vocational education has to start there. Um, we have to really reshape the 11 to 16 curriculum. I don't know if you know that only 11% of students in the 11 to 16 year old schools now study computing. Only 11% in a digital age. It is absolutely amazing that that is the case. And uh, when uh, Gibb canceled the, um, the, the lower rate in GSC, which he did in 2012, 43% of our students are now, fewer, are now studying computing than they did. This is, this is an absurd fantasy when you're living in a digital age. So this has come down to 16. The procedure that Gove did then is very similar to the procedure that's been done now. Lady Wolf was again asked to look at technical qualifications, just as she are, are being asked to look at GCSEs. And needless to say, she came up with the answer that Gove and others and the, um, the Department of Education wanted, is that there should be a considerable reduction in technical qualifications and the introduction of a new T-level exam at uh, 18. I think what is needed is a, a T-back at 18, which is much more general than what you're going to be offered in the future. And uh, the, the actual Skills Act um, is going to create even greater apartheid in our education system because um, those, all the heads of schools will say in the future, the only way you can get to university is to stay on in the sixth form. If you drop out at 16, you're going to a system where you might just get an apprenticeship, you, you might get a lower technical qualification, but quite frankly, your chances of going to university are not going to be very high. That's what they will do. And, um, and, and, and they'll say um, you, to their students, you will want to uh, choose the A-levels in which you did best at GCSEs, and therefore you won't want to do a lot of the things that they're trying to offer now with T-levels. And so I think this is a very misguided policy, as you can see, uh, but the government is persisting with it very strongly. Um, I don't think the new Secretary of State is going to be a reforming Secretary of State. I think he's been captured by the department already, and he is going to support very strongly the existing system of progress at EBAC, um, and as much of the system as, as works as the, that is based upon that. Um, we um, in the University Technical College movement now have some of the most successful schools in the country from the point of view of destination. We have 47. And half of those last July had no people leaving to join the unemployed register. They either went on to university 55% or 20% became apprenticeships or they got local jobs. Some went to other, other colleges. And no other schools have that degree of destination success. And as a result, we're now being heavily oversubscribed, um, having had a difficult time with some, some we've had to close because they haven't worked out. But now they're now oversubscribed and there is a need for more. Now, when it comes to introduction of T-levels, um, one of the UTCs has been one of the experimental uh, colleges in the first year and they did digital. The Lee UTC in Dartford now um, recruits children at 11. And at 11, they do computing and engineering for an hour or two a week. And so by 14, they choose, 76% choose to go on to do digital. Um, and so it can be done. And in fact, one of the reasons why there should be a fundamental change in the curriculum is that now many primary schools are doing coding with coding clubs. So their 11 year olds, when they come to leave, will be able to do simple coding. But when they go into a secondary school that doesn't have computing, they'll be going backwards for four years. And that is absolutely absurd. There is no joined up thinking at all in the government's policy in this matter. So this particular UTC, 10 students elected to go for T-levels. After about two or three weeks, three dropped out. And what we've discovered is that T-levels are best suited for students 
you'll get to the level seven, eight, and nine in the GCSE list. I think that anybody who only gets to five, four, three, two, and one will have very little relationship with sea levels. Sixes, some can cope, some can't cope. And one mustn't forget that sea levels is predominantly an academic examination with a test, as a written test at the end of it. Um, and 80% of it is meant to be in schools being taught. I think that presents a huge problem to FE colleges, whether they're going to offer T levels at that level. Because you're going to an FE college, you visit um, workshop after workshop and only a, a relatively small number of classrooms. And so there's a big problem there in itself. But the government is determined to make uh, T levels as successful as possible. They're throwing a great deal of money at it, um, giving assistance to schools who want to do it, um, giving assistance to some employers who want to provide work experience. Um, and I think that forced introduction is a mistake. Um, T levels will only succeed if employers and youngsters want to take them. If youngsters want to take them, the diploma largely failed because youngsters didn't want to take it or they were offered huge numbers of extra A levels if they took diplomas. They didn't want to take it. Employers didn't familiarize themselves with it. Whereas employers are very, very familiar now with BTECs. They've been using them for years and years and years. And they know that to get a qualified technician, the best way is a BTEC. Um, a BTEC itself or an extended diploma or AGC, whatever it's called, an OCR as well. And um, in effect, uh, the government has said they're going to publish a list in 2024 of the number of BTECs which are going to be excluded. And a very large number will be excluded. One of the things I think that is quite wrong, and I moved an amendment to it in the Lords, is that um, no one's going to be allowed, some BTECs are, are remaining, of course, single subject BTECs, but no student is allowed to take two BTECs. No student in the future is going to be allowed. This is the first time in the history of education that students have actually been debarred taking a qualification. They're not going to be allowed to take two BTECs, whereas 20% uh, of black students get into universities with two, two BTECs at the moment. Well, Baker, they, sorry, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to press you just wait, wait, short, short of time. Apologies. Okay, right. Okay, well, in that case, I will end on this. So the black students, 20% you know, of black students get into universities. And so I think we've got to do a great deal to persuade the government not to cancel so many BTECs and the extended diplomas. Thank you, Lord Baker. Uh, apologies for, um, for, for, for ending, cutting you off shortly, shortly there. But uh, like I say, we, we do want to hear from Ruth and Matt and then open it up for questions. A few people have been commenting it already. And it, it, it struck me um, as, as quite a clear uh, thing, I think, in, in the kind of age categories. You're very much focused on new policies uh, and radical reform for the kind of the, the, the 11 to 14 year olds um, at level two in particular. And I think the Labour Party with the diploma, that was very much where they were, were heading. That failed miserably as you've described. And, and now the current government seem quite, um, quite focused at level three, um, uh, the 16 to 18. And there's, there's definitely a, a challenge there in terms of difference of opinion. Um, and I'd like to come back to the BTEC situation and pose the question perhaps if you were the minister um, posed by your civil servants with a dilemma, uh, stop some BTECs and allow T levels to survive and flourish, or allow BTECs to continue and T levels will go the way of the BTEC of the 14 to 90 diploma and not be popular enough and fail. What do you do, especially when you've got 600 million pounds a year of extra money from the Treasury if the T levels continue? Quite a difficult decision for a minister in, uh, at the moment and the sort of position he used to be in. So I'd like to return to that if we may uh, later, Lord Baker. But before then, delighted to be joined by Matt Jones. Uh, Matt is the principal at the ARC Global Academy. Opening remarks from you, please, Matt. Yeah, my, my there's a bit of delay. Um, uh, and unlike Lord Baker, uh, thank you very much, Lord Baker, for that uh, interesting um, instruction. But uh, I won't be giving any history lessons. I'll be focused on the, uh, the present and what the reality is for us facing this uh, policy announcement. And so when any policy, particularly in education, is announced, the, my first reflection is, you know, what's the what problem they're trying to solve? What is the purpose? Um, and I, I don't want to get into a big philosophical debate about, you know, the purpose of education, but particularly around um, the, the vocational question. 
uh, and the routes into employment. With this particular announcement, yeah, I see that they're, they're trying to, are they trying to solve three potential things? They're not mutually exclusive, but firstly, are they trying to provide young people with uh, the skills, knowledge and experiences that better facilitate a smooth transition from formal education or school day education into the workplace? Is it to help employers to develop a skilled workforce and reduce sector specific uh, shortages, labour shortages? Or is it to provide students with Hello? high quality education uh, and, and empower them to make informed choices about their careers? Now, like I said, none of those are mutually exclusive, but what I would say as an educator and as a parent, the, the, the factor that drives me most is around ensuring that uh, we have a focus on empowering our young people so that each stage of their journey through our school and beyond, they are well informed and have the skills to make good choices for them. And it seems to me that at the moment, um, the, the, the announcement made is trying to solve a problem that I, I don't think necessarily exists. However, what I would add is that um, there does seem to be, into Lord Baker's um, speech, around uh, a differential in quality or certainty around your route into employment. So the, the world into academia is well experienced, well trodden. Uh, as an educator, I'm comfortable with giving young people advice into the institutions that they choose it into. They go into a, a university. We know the entry criteria. We're very clear about that. We know the process they have to go through. You go at a certain time of year uh, and there's a really robust evaluation of the quality of the institutions. You then look at the current situation around apprenticeships, um, which the almost complete opposite applies uh, there around uh, the robust evaluation of the quality of the institution, the entry times and the process vary depending on the experience. So that field leaves us um, uh, pretty much on shore. More specifically, uh, for the 16-year-old, uh, potentially, or 15, 16-year-old, who's making that decision um, at that age about well, what are their next steps when, you know, I don't know about anyone in the audience, but certainly my own children, uh, and I don't talk about children at school, my own uh, children at home, they didn't know what they wanted to do until they got to university. And even then, it, it was they were unclear. And so it seems to me that uh, the removal of BTEX will cause uh, anxiety and increase the dropouts that Lord Baker spoke to earlier for young people because they haven't had the opportunity to either gain the skills and experiences that they need to flourish in the workplace or have a real understanding of the, the careers they, they would like to pursue and the job market they'd like to, to enter. And so going forward, I think the removal of the BTEX will remove that choice and reduce the opportunity for young people to make informed choices as they go through the, the system. And when I consider that uh, specifically what BTEX have done for us at Globe, um, it would be foolhardy just to remove a whole sway of BTEX because it's provided our young people with genuine opportunity and genuine choice right up until the age of 18, 19. And I will give you a little bit of context of our Globe. We are in South East London, Elephant and Castle. We serve uh, a community that is represented in the top um, quintile for deprivation, a very diverse community. Um, and when, when I set up the Globe 6 form, Art Globe 6 form, I, I have to be honest, I, I was very specific about it being a, an academic six form. So I, I wanted our students to have the, the choice of disadvantaged community to go to university. Um, because when I speak to other schools in our local area, Dulwich College, uh, and I talk about the exit routes for their children, um, very rarely are they mentioning anything other than going to an elite university and, for, and they're in Southwark. So if it's good enough for their children in Southwark, it's good enough for our children in Southwark. So we've had that ambition, but I was convinced by the uh, ARC lead at the time for our Pathways Enrichment team that we could consider BTEX. Um, but I'd always had an, a, a negative experience with BTEX in my education career to that point, which was that they, they sometimes lack rigor. They didn't adequately prepare students uh, for their next stage of learning, either be it with an employer or into university. But what was great about, and what was sold to me about the, the ARC professional pathways is it was more than just a, a qualification to be studied. The BTEC uh, and with ARC, they offer a range of wraparound skills and experiences that mean that young people not only gain the 
requisite skills in their chosen field or their chosen qualification, but they have regular sustained in, in, um, engagement with employers. They get really high quality careers and advice and guidance into uh, in employment. And they develop a confidence uh, and create networks of people who can be their champions and help them either into the workplace or give them great advice of going into university. So the, the challenge I suspect isn't for me, and I would say this humbly, uh, T levels or BTECs. I think BTECs are essential to keeping that choice open. But for those young people who are who are certain what they would like to do in terms of vocational route and going to employment, the choice really for me is between T levels and apprenticeships. How how are we ensuring that those people who are certain about the career path that they would like to go down uh, engage with high quality employers that will take them from the age of 16 all the way through into full-time adult employment. And at the moment, it seems to me that the, the issue is that the apprenticeship route is too inconsistent uh, and doesn't offer that consistency and make sure that the, the people that are taking those routes get a really good experience, an experience in similar in quality, but not necessarily in content to what you would get at most universities. So uh, I'm a strong advocate for uh, BTEX. I think they are, keep the choice open um, and as that's dictated by our outcomes at Art Globe Academy and it, this may sound a little bit immodest but what I would say is that Art Globe we're a state school um, our access rates to top third universities are similar to that of grammar schools and independent schools i.e regularly over 60 percent enter top third universities and um, what is interesting is that there is very little differential between our A-level pathway students to top third university and or our BTEC students in top third universities but also we've had students leave us and access degree apprenticeships uh, and immediately become the highest there in their families. We've had a, a number of students go to off to places like De Deloitte and have onto degree apprenticeships and um, at 18 and become well, well employed and significant earners and then can make that choice as they go through into their adult career to stay in that sector. So strong advocate for BTEX. I think the, the reform needs to be a, a more around the vocational route and how do you encourage more employers, high quality employers to engage in early, early with schools to help that that experience be as robust and as rigorous and as meaningful as a route into universities. Thank you very much, Matt. Really appreciate your contribution. We'll be coming back to you in the Q&A. Um, no surprises that you're an advocate of the BTEX, not because you're uh, Matt, but because you are a leader of a, of a sixth form college. Um, I speak to uh, a whole range of further education and school providers, and they all say the same thing, is that they want choice. And who wouldn't want choice? And there's, there's something perhaps quite um, strange about a conservative government, liberal government, they say, um, looking to limit um, choice um by uh trying to strip away uh, a competing alternative route um and interesting that you're you're, you're able to use these btex through your art professional pathways to create with the wraparound uh, a product for your uh, students that, that works well for them and, and their progressions again i'd like to return just to repeat to that question though if you're the secretary of state for education right now treasury are giving you 600 million pounds a year extra in return for a five day a week full-time new program called the T-Level, much more substantial vocational program with 600 million more money. And your civil servants are telling you the only way we can make this work is to take away some of the long-standing competition. What do you do? Um, and I think that would be one that I'd like us to return to. Before we do that, I'm particularly keen to hear from Ruth Coyle. Um, Ruth is, I've mentioned before, director of the sixth form at uh, La Retraite. Now, Ruth, as she'll come on, I'm sure will tell you, has been one of the first uh, providers, schools, colleges, to um, start offering, delivering, teaching the actual T-level itself in a, a range of, uh, of the pathways out there. So really keen to hear from her perspective how that's going and, and any other thoughts you'll have in her opening remarks with regard to the future of technical and vocational education. Ruth, over to you. Okay, afternoon everybody. So we um, are a comprehensive sixth form in South London. We have been doing A-levels and vocational qualifications for over 20 years. Um, about two years ago, we introduced the T-levels. What I really like about the T-levels is I really think they're giving employers what they want because for many years, we've done a lot of work with the livery companies and the livery companies are saying, young people aren't coming out with the skills needed in the workplace. 
So the fact that T-levels have been written by employers, they really are getting those technical skills that they needed. All of our teachers, before they started delivering on the T-levels, they were paid to go on industry placements through the ETF. So your teachers can get paid £400 a day to go out on industry placements. When you look at the specification, it's really bang up to date, technical skills the students are getting developed with. I think these qualifications really encourage social mobility. You know, I think they are superior to the BTEC qualifications in the fact they develop those up to date technical skills. Our experience with the T levels has been very positive. Most of the students on our T levels just have a four and five in maths and English, but 100% of our students pass the core exams. Um, on the childcare, 60% um, got A grades, that's three A's at A level, and 40% of the digital got A grades. Those children, if I'd have put them on A level courses, they would not be getting those grades. The reason why I think they perform so well on the T levels is because of the industry placements. And it's the way you develop the course. Because the children are actually going out and seeing the theory and practice, they can pick up really difficult concepts much more quickly than they would if they didn't have that industry placement. So I have to say, I was skeptical about the T-levels before we introduced them. I was like, these children aren't gonna be able to cope with them, but they really have risen to the challenge. And it's about the way you deliver the course in conjunction with the business that really helps those students flourish. And those students, they're really passionate about the area that they want to go into. So the childcare students, they want to work with young people. The digital students are really into coding. I'm thinking of one student we have on the digital course. His English grade is really poor, but he's the best coder on the course. So we've sparked something in him and he's really developing that skill and he's got his niche. Um, I understand your concerns that students might find it difficult and focus on one subject area at the age of 16, but actually, when you actually look at the T level, so within the digital T level, it's a bit like studying business, IT and programming. When you look at the childcare T level, it's like studying psychology, health and biology. So within the T level, you do have different subject disciplines and we do have different subject A level specialists teaching on the T levels. And um, because obviously they're used to preparing students for exams, but I'm a great advocate for them. The um, money the government have given us to improve the facilities for the students is fantastic. So the students are now getting state of the art facilities that they would have when they go out into industry. We've never had that kind of funding before with the OCR technicals or the BTECs. So for me, it's about getting the best for the students. Most of the students in our sixth form are first generation university. They don't have a network of employers that they can access. So really getting this network of good quality employers for them is what's going to give them um, the step up to the career in their future. Thank you so much for that contribution, Ruth. And really interesting to hear firsthand from a uh, provider, not just from people like me and, uh, and others in the kind of uh, commentary space who have all these concerns about where are the work placements going to be and can they, do they really want five days a week and are they too young to, to have specialisms and all these worries and concerns about change. So really interesting. I mean, you haven't yet quite finished with your first cohort, uh, a few more months for their final exams, I imagine, but really interesting to hear some really positive experiences. And it, and it shouldn't go, of course, un, unnoticed that the government have invested a significant sum of new money, new treasury money, um, ramping up, as I've mentioned before, up to uh, ramping uh, last few years up to 600 million pounds um, to fund these uh, these courses that you get a lot more funding per student uh, to be able to deliver around 900 hours a year uh, compared to around 600 hours uh, for, for other level three or, or similar non-T-level programs. So there's a, a, a you know, and, and arguably you've been given a lot of money via the ETF and others uh, as part of capacity building uh, and, uh, and preparing uh, to, you know, to learn as the pilot, in a sense, the guinea pigs, uh, and then to share, share that knowledge. So, so far, a lot of new money, a lot of investment. Uh, um, the big question for me, if I may start with you, Ruth, would be, it's brilliant to hear such a positive experience so far, but I, I couldn't help but notice that you didn't tackle the tricky question of, fine, T-levels so far so good, 
but what if the government were to take away your level three alternative in the in the applied general space anything that was potentially competing the big question is around choice or lack of in the future what's what's your view as an organization are you still running those alternative options and and, and what would it mean to you if if the funding were to be switched off for them so we currently still offer ocr technicals and um, but our admissions have increased quite dramatically so we were only quite a small sixth form um, of under 200 and um, now we're going up to 350 so we're actually getting to the point where we can't fit any more people in um, so actually we found it really advantageous because the children and the parents are quite excited about the fact their students are going to go out and work in a real job and get that experience but so back to the original question if the government were to remove if the policy was to go through as it seems to have been currently planned in a few years although it has been delayed somewhat and, and that OCR was no longer an option for you because it was no longer paid for from the public purse. What happens to those students? What, what, what can you offer them instead? Would they have to do the T-level well, or so, is there an alternative? So we, have, we also have the transition course. So for those students um, who are not quite ready for the T-level, we, we also offer the transition course where they can reset their maths and English and then develop their technical skills onto that course. Um, and then progress either onto a T level or onto an apprenticeship. So you've got. So are you saying, you know, in a sense, the opposite of of, of Matt? Are you saying you haven't got any concerns regarding a, a policy shift away from applied generals? I, I think what is advantageous about the T level is it's giving the student that industry placement alongside the vocational context. I so understand I, your positivity I, towards the T-level. Before we started introducing the T-levels, I was concerned because I okay. thought those students won't be able to cope. Now I'm actually doing them, I'm not concerned. So, so you don't have a great concern if, if, as I say, if the policy were to change away from applied generals. That's that's fair enough. No. Okay. So on that point, if I, if I may start with, uh, with Lord Baker, you, you've been a Secretary of State before, you've no doubt um uh had your dealings with the treasury um the current secretary of state has, has, has stepped in a few months ago and has a pretty decent settlement made a few years ago for t levels in particular it's a separate budget line in the in the uh, in in their accounts they have to they have to spend it on t levels it can't be spent it can't be vied into anything else it's about as i say 600 million which is a lot uh per year it's just for 16 to 18 year olds just for t levels um if you're sat there with your civil servants and the civil servants are cautioning uh, anything which might compete in a, in a in a space that would undermine up to 25 different routes, uh, there, there needs to be wide geographic coverage. You know, you what you soon start to see is that if you in a, it can become quite a crowded space and, and courses need to have 20, maybe 20 kids in them in each classroom to make them viable for the institutions. If those civil servants, Lord Baker, are saying to you, it's keep on with the BTECs or the T-levels will fail, what would you be saying if you were sat there as the Secretary of State? You'll need to unmute yourself, Lord Baker. Sorry, Lord Baker, could you, would you be able to unmute yourself? Thank you. Just need Lord Baker to be unmuted. Matt, can I pose that question for you just while we try and resolve the sound for Lord Baker? Thank you. Well, what, what a glorious position to be in if I was a Secretary of State. So I, I think that, um, Look, uh, maybe maybe I've got a joint view of this, but uh, from Arc's perspective, Arc Globe's perspective, where we've had huge benefits, if the problem, if the issue we're trying to solve is make sure that we've got um, a, a range of courses and routes into employment uh, and/or university, then the thing that the Arc Enrichment and Path or Pathways Enrichment team have done is they created um, a network of employers who are able to and willing to commit to engaging with schools with our current suite of qualifications. And so the experience our young people have is, yes, they get their academics if they're doing A-level, but if they're doing their BTECs, they'll do their vocational or applied learning, but then they get the same opportunities you would do through a D-level by the employers being engaged. That takes coordination, time and effort. And the benefit of being in the art network is that we have a team that specialise in that. So as a school leader, I know that I can concentrate on developing uh, the curriculum, the academic curriculum and or the applied 
general sure. curriculum, knowing that the the the, the coordination sure. piece but, happens outside. But, but I, I want to jump in and put you in that unenviable position of being the Secretary of State who has mm. to make decisions every day, gets his red box full of papers mm. at the end of the day, mm. I'm no doubt. And uh, civil servants are eager for answers. And, and they know that ultimately it's the decision of the Secretary of State. So it doesn't matter if it's a difficult decision, they're going to have to make that decision. Uh, press the button or don't press the button. So is it, you know, maybe there is no answer, but but can you at least empathise with the uh, problem? Uh, because I think it's a genuine one. Uh, and I've spoken to a lot of people, including within government, that for T-levels to survive, you probably do have, I mean, they've made an, a monopoly for the awarding organisations. They probably need to make a monopoly for the curriculum as well uh, in that vocational space at level three for it to, you know, mm. to force the, the colleges and schools to, to offer it. Yes, that's perfectly true. Thank you you asked me, you're not, government doesn't quite work right the way you're thinking it does work. Um, when I introduced fundamental changes in the 1980s, I was determining them before the Treasury were funding them. I then persuaded Margaret to accept them, and we went to the Treasury for more money. This was making schools grant maintained schools. This was making the first city technology college independent of local authorities. This was uh, making schools responsible for their own budgets. These were not Treasury policies. They were policies of educationists. And therefore, any education policy should not be made, driven by the money available or not. You should get the education policy right first and then persuade the various forces, particularly the Treasury, to support you. That's how it should be done. And that is not how T-level has been done. Various decisions have been taken by a very small number of ministers, principally around Gove, sure. uh, to do this, to impose a, a discipline on the curriculum which has consequences. But we are, we are where we are, Lord Baker. We, you know, we... There are no way we are where we are. We, we've got to try and change it to the better. He has imposed, in fact, the socialist planning form of the national curriculum. It was never voted on by either the House of Commons or the House of Lords in sure. 2010 and 12. Never. And he's done exactly the same, or rather his successor have done exactly the same to tackle education. But what, what, what do you say, Lord Baker, to, to, Ruth, Co to, Ruth, to Ruth Coyle? What, what do you say in response to her positive experience? You know, you've talked about your positive well, experience it's, at UTC. I think it's very encouraging. I think it's very, very encouraging. But I, I don't. I don't think she. I think she has a, a sixth form college, is it, or a sixth form sixth form college? Well, the problem simply is this: the way youngsters up until sixteen have not done any technical subject at all, why should they suddenly switch suddenly to a technical subject restricted to one type of particular employment? It, it, every head will say to the students, "Stay on with me. I'll get you onto the university." They won't. That's what he will say, or he she will say. And don't take the experiment. It's all an experiment. And so therefore, you're going to have an even greater education apart that as a result. Sure. And, and that I think, takes can, us... I just say, can I just say one thing about the skills curriculum? Because we're very familiar with it. Now, the skills curriculum does not, does not teach CAD CAM. It's not in the T-level curriculum. It's basically based upon coding. And they do a good job on coding. I, I admit that entirely. Coding is only one of the skills needed. Now, without CAD CAM, you can't actually operate a 3D printer. And 3D printers are going to be the most important thing sure. in, in the next industrial, the present industrial revolution. Sure. Companies are using them, but actually, when you've got a T level, I don't know whether Carla said it, can they actually operate a 3D printer in your college? Do you have sure. hundreds of 3D printers for the students to be inventive? Sure, I, and I, I hear what you're saying. I, I no doubt the Institute for Apprenticeships and Technical Education, you know, will continually look with their employee groups at what the curriculum contains and, and reform it accordingly. I wonder if I wonder if we can put your point, um, Lord Baker, which which I referenced earlier from your from, from what you said earlier around the age bands, as it were. And, and clearly, you're very passionate about the younger, the 11, 12, 13, 14 year olds, and and their uh, their exposure to technical and vocational education. Um, I wonder if I can put that to Ruth in terms of, of t terms of the cohorts that you're taking age 16. Do you think that's the right age? I mean, it, se it seems from experience, a lot of parents think any earlier might be problematic, certainly in the current, um, the current vocational uh, and, and school space. Ruth, from your perspective, when you, as I say, when you take them on at 16, where are you with, with Lord Baker's view that, that they should have had more time uh, uh, on, on non-academic subjects prior to that age? 
Well, I totally agree with Lord Baker on that. We're an 11 to 19 school and we've actually adapted our key stage three curriculum. So there is more DT, there is more coding. Our students at key stage four can choose vocational subjects alongside GCSEs. But I do agree we should have some sort of technical academic diploma from the age of 14 because actually some children just get really frustrated in that GCSE route and why are we still even doing GCSEs when they all stay on anyway? Can I ask you Ruth, um, we don't talk much about the transition programme because it's not the shiny shiny T level, it's the kind of preparing for T level but it is something that with the Association of Colleges, with the Education and Training Foundation, the government have been investing money into this kind of bridging concept and I think when the uh, the Sainsbury Review uh, which first promoted the, the concept of the T level, uh, when they first came out it was intended that the transition programme would be would be very work based uh, in terms of industri industry industry placement, almost like a traineeship. Um, what it's actually become, as far as I can tell, is actually very classroom based, the opposite. Um, uh, and from what I understand, you, you still need at that level two or two and a half, um, you still need to have chosen your pathway. Um, How's that working for you? And, and do you, I appreciate you're, you're fairly new to it. Of course, it's a new programme. But it, it does mean, of course, that, that, that they'll be with you for three years. Um, yeah. And, and what, does that, what does that retention look like, do you think, in this early time? Yeah, so we've always had a level two offer in the sixth form. And about 80% of those children then progress on to um, level three qualifications afterwards. Um, because we can spend more time intensively with them on the resetting the maths and English. And then it's really a skills based qualification, helping them develop skills for the workplace. And then they do some tasters, depending on what kind of area that they want to go into in the future. So some children just do need that extra year. Yeah, absolutely. No, I think I think that's well understood. Lord Baker, I think you wanted to come in on that one. No, I agree. I, I think that what she said is I agree with entirely. I think the big mistake that Labour made was they did not accept the Thomson report to have a phase in education from 14 to 18, because this is happening in, in Europe. Europe is moving to upper and lower secondary at 15, 13, 14 and 15. And but, what we should be yeah, I've got, uh, sorry, do you, do you, come yes. to Matt, I'll, I'll, I'll bring you. I'll bring you in in a minute. But if I if I can, Lord yeah. Baker, I'm just I just wonder: had you been a Stel Morris, had you been the Secretary of State, would you have ended A levels? Because that's what Tomlinson would have required. Um, that is what persuaded Tony Blair to reject it. Indeed. Blank and Adonis both supported the 14 to 18. I would have gone to the 14 to 18, and I'd have placed A levels with a tech back. Okay, so you would have been willing to be in that Secretary of State, that Secretary yes, of State, then. fair yeah. enough, absolutely. Matt, you wanted to come in. Yeah, I, I, I'm just... I've come in enough, yes. <laughs> no, for Matt. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, uh, look, I think that um, we, we've got to be careful here about what assumptions we're making uh, when we say certain courses for certain students at certain uh, points in their journey. Like I said earlier, my responsibility is to keep their choices open for as long as possible as I want for my own children. And by saying you're a sheep and you're a goat at 14, you're on this route into employment, but you you guys, you're gonna have an opportunity to go to university, I think is misguided. And it's essentially the, this new policy is taking a sledgehammer to a nut. You know, uh, the, the BTEC pathway that we've created at um, ARC is to ensure that our young people not only get applied qualifications, but they get that work-based specific support and experience because we engage meaningfully with employees. And I would use that money to create um, regional business hubs that would engage intensely, but based around the current um, a qualification system to engage meaningfully and sustainably with schools to give them that experience beyond the, the time that they spend in the classroom. Thank you, Matt. I agree with that, I agree with that entirely. Can I just say on BTEX? I think that lots of students, want, what BTEX do, they, can, they produce qualified technicians and capable of going to level four and five. That is what they can do. And that is where the big skills gaps are actually at that level. And the important point about that is that when they get to level four and five, if you want a plumber in London, for Pimico plumbers, it's 80 pounds an hour. So you're talking about 600 quid a day to have a plumber. So if you've got a qualified technician who become a plumber, they do levels four and five. They don't want to go to level six to get a university qualification, foundation degree or a seven. And there are lots of people, lots of people, 
who, who, who live in the areas where Matt Tone lives and near where Ruth lives, who want to become qualified technicians, not necessarily thinking of going to university. And that is what the BTEC offers as an opportunity. Absolutely. You mentioned uh, earlier, um, Lord Baker, uh, Tony Blair. Now, of course, um, his son, Ewan Blair, um, uh, was involved in establishing an apprenticeship training provider. That apprenticeship training provider has done rather well and recently sold for many, 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 many millions and renamed itself um, Multiverse. And we have a question from Akeem Wane, uh, I hope we pronounced that right, uh, from Multiverse. Uh, and I'm going to paraphrase it slightly because I'm going to want really pithy answers, if that's OK, just because of the limited time that we have. It would be great to have more time, but we are limited. Um, it, the question was around what steps can we take as education professionals to make vocational technical education be deemed as equal, if that's what you want it to be, equal to traditional academic roots. So I'm just gonna paraphrase that and, and ask if you could do, if you were the Secretary of State and could do one thing, <laughs> one thing, uh, and, and it could involve extra money or not, although it would be easier if it didn't, um, <laughs> probably, uh, what one thing would you do um, to uh, make the VOC tech education in, in these words, uh, deemed equal to the tra traditional academic route. And I'm going to start in reverse order with Ruth. So I think we need to adopt a system like Germany, where employers are expected to take young people on into significant industry placements at the age of 16, because actually that's their skills pipeline for the future. And we have to get rid of this snobbery of the difference between academic and technical education. In fact, the technical students are probably going to go on to earn much sure. more in the future. So let, me, let, me jump, let me jump in there because it's a perennial problem about employer engagement. And the government have, have shifted over many years to a point now where they're taxing them through apprenticeships to try and get them to do it. Um, and they are looking very carefully at financially incentivizing them through T-levels to do it. Um, in Germany, um, their system, it, it's a legal requirement. In fact, legally, they have to have training managers as well. Um, so it's completely different. It's, it's easy to compare to Germany, but actually their whole structure is quite different. So how would you make an employer take a young person? Do you, is it through persuasion or is it through coercion? Well, MPs can change the law, can't they? They can. Okay, through the law. I like it. I like yeah. it. Well, we'll see if there's time for a, a Lord Baker, another Lord Baker amendment. I think we've missed the boat. I think that was yesterday. Uh, we missed the boat on amendments to the uh, to the skills bill. Right, Matt, uh, if you could do one thing as Secretary of State for Education to, uh, I'll use that horrible term, parity of esteem, uh, what would you do? I, I'd ensure that um, each um, route, vocational route into employment has a substantial residential immersive experience, like you do for university. Take them away out of their comfort zone, um, take them to an environment where they create new networks, have immersive experience over a period of time. I think that would give parity straight away. The, the problem with a vocational or um, uh, apprenticeships is that the young person just stays in their environment and they just stay in their locale. And for most people, where they grow is where they have a different experience and it stretches them and broadens their horizons. Really interesting. I'm quite taken by, I mean, I don't know how much it would cost, but I'm quite taken by that, by that idea, Matt, particularly because one of my concerns with the T-level is the localism associated with the industry placement. And if you're in an, a rural area, you're probably not going to be offered a T-level, let alone find a, a digital employer um, uh, other than maybe the local authority and the NHS Trust. So, yeah, I mean, we've taken by that idea of geographical distance uh, through that experience and, and, and broadening those horizons. So, yeah, really interesting. Thanks, Matt. Uh, Lord Baker, um, I'm sure you've got 10 or 20 things, but you've got one, do, one thing. What I would do is very simple. I would ensure that every child at school who never went to school will have listened to somebody speaking to them over the last of the course, saying that you realise that by the age of 18, if you become an apprentice, you could earn £20,000 a year. And if you get it work for the Navy at the, at the same age of 18, they pay you 32500 a year to be a hired apprentice. So that sounds very much like a... What you're describing yeah, very but much. Yeah, but you must, you must get over to the youngsters. Sure. There's real money available. And the problem is that not enough small and medium-sized companies can provide the cost of providing an apprentice. But we just have it in our report to the House of Lords. So the yeah. big companies also, even the biggest companies only have about five or six hundred apprentices a year. It's, in, it's interesting. Um, I mean, we've not used, I don't think we've yet used the term careers advice or, or careers education. Um, and I know how passionate you are about that as well. And, and you're famed in part, a small part of your many fames uh, being the Baker Clause. I, in fact, I, I ran a, a, an event in the te te Terrace Parliament yesterday, an awards event, and we had the 
Robert Halfen, the, uh, the, the MP, the chair of the Select Committee, um, who um, I, I would argue has been attempting to create a kind of Baker Halfen uh, uh, amendment recently, where he wants a minimum of three engagements a year rather than the proposed one engagement. So yeah, he's a kind absolutely of, a right. Baker Plus uh, on that if, one. If, if, if I had a pound for every time everybody's used the Baker clause, I would be a billionaire, I should think. It's certainly it. very popular in the vocational. Quite frankly, it's not very implemented. That's no. the trouble. It's certainly very popular with the people that want to get into schools, not necessarily as popular with the schools that, that want to be left to, uh, to their own devices. Um, right, we've got about two minutes. I wanted to end on a very, very topical note. I trust that you have been listening carefully and reading carefully the news today. Uh, the government haven't actually published yet their response to the Orga review of further and higher education, uh, which was about, which is nearly three years after the uh, rep the, the actual um, independent review was published. Uh, that's due to be published tomorrow. You might be forgiven for thinking, having listened to the news today, that it is actually being published, and it hasn't. Um, it's just been the pre-briefings, -briefing, mainly to the Telegraph, although there is now a press release from the DfE out there in the ether that I have, have looked at. Unsurprisingly, all the headlines are, 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 are focused around the cost of higher education and who's going to pay for it and so on. But it has been interesting that the English and maths requirement, um, uh, which looks like is being proposed in a, in a consultation being published tomorrow, um, is causing quite a bit of consternation. And this is the idea that you wouldn't be able to, in future, be able to get a loan. Uh, so if, unless you could afford to pay for your um, uh, your university degree, a higher education degree, then you would um, uh, you would need to have passed your le your level two English and maths, typically a GCSE, but I guess it could be an alternative like a functional skill. In a very short, more or less yes or no, how taken are you by this? Because before you all say it's a terrible idea, I presume it probably would send quite a lot of young people. I mean, I think they're about this would affect about eighteen thousand young people at the moment. It probably would send quite a lot of them and maybe their schools down the apprenticeship route if the employers are there. Um, so rather than tackling the quality of the course, it looks like they're tackling the quality of the educational experience for the individual. I'm not saying I'm in favour of it at all, and I've not read the detail, nor have you, but just briefly, if we can, and we'll go in the, the same order we started, starting with Lord Baker. Have you seen this and what's your view? I think the government's trying to cut back on higher expenditure, but basically, I would leave it very much as it is, quite frankly. We, even with lots of youngsters going to university, which isn't really suitable for them, I always thought myself as education secretary, about 35% of the country would want to go to university. I never expected it to be as high as over now 52%. But even at 52%, the rate of dropout after a year is infinitely lower than universities in Rome or Paris or Germany, infinitely okay. lower. So, so, so you're you're a politician um, calling for for no change, which is um, surprising. <laughs> well, I think we should think about it a bit, but uh, yeah. it will have very, very big consequences. Actually. For sure, for sure, and and I'm no doubt, no doubt, as I understand, this is a consultation. It would take it would take many years to be implemented, and I'm sure everyone will want to feedback, and, and we'll be it having no doubt. It has flavours of Aristotle about it. No doubt there will be future ARC talks in maybe, uh, maybe that's the ARC talk for, uh, for April. Um, I will mention what's coming up in March, shortly after we've heard from Matt. Matt, very shortly, because we're about to run over, um, a hot take on the, uh, on the HEFE uh, consultation due tomorrow. Uh, I'll be very, it depends on what uh, they're saying is, qualifies as a past English and maths. If it's a, yeah, if it's a four, I think it's I'm, a five, I'm, probably. Right, so then, then I would, which is not great. And so if it's a five, we've had students because they arrived late in the country or because of disruptive education, who got fours in one English or the other maths, uh, but then they've gone off to a top, a literally a top third university. So, um, and or into great employment. And so um, I, I would not want to limit people's choice. I'm all so, about choice. So you'd definitely be pushing hard for a four, if, if at all. Four, Ruth, absolutely. I wonder if you have a view. If you've had a chance, I think, to see all, this. I think in order to strengthen our economy, we need to invest in technical education. University is not the be all and end all. Yeah, that's fair enough, and I certainly would say that, I given agree. the given given the uh, given the Orga report, we had uh, Alison Wolf again. She seems to be involved in every report, Professor Alison Wolf um, or Lady Wolf, as uh, uh, Kenneth Baker referred to her. Um, she's in number ten. She's still very much three days a week doing policy. I actually think policy is being driven by number 10, uh, very much more so than the department. Um, and no doubt she'll be uh, pushing very hard for the FE 
vocational uh, spending to remain high profile, which is what Orga wanted. We didn't really want it to become just a, an HE conversation about how much loans cost. So, so certainly I hope the FE and vocational uh, sector will, will keep pointing out how, uh, how much they remain the smaller partner, despite all the, the rhetoric about how important the sector is. Right, so we, that was uh, fantastic. It was, you know, doesn't an hour go quickly and we we're actually run over a little bit. So my apologies as chair for that, but I hope I am forgiven because I certainly found that really engaging and interesting. Um, it was, thank you so much, Ark, for bringing some really interesting speakers together, um, really interesting range of perspectives and views and experiences. Um, particularly interesting to hear Ruth's take, obviously, on the T-level already, um, two, well, a year and a bit uh, into that delivery and the transition program as part of that. Matt, um, with obviously the Ark program and, and the use of the BTEX, and who doesn't like to hear from a lord, and particularly Lord Kenneth Baker, when it comes to um, uh, the uh, the education space in particular, and others, no doubt. So thank you so much for that. So on that note, just again to repeat my thanks to Ruth, to Lord Kenneth Baker, to uh, Matt, and to Ark for this particular Ark Talks, which will be made available on their website uh, as a recording briefly after the session. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.